here, in contrast, Paul is going to give some positives about how we are to live this godly life. And of course, the question we often would ask ourselves is, how and what hope is there for us to live a godly life in a world in which we live? How do God's people reach their potential? How do we become all that God wants us to be? Hopefully, by the time we're finished, I'll have some answers for you. If not, um, you'll have to come and see me afterwards. But we're going to break it down into bite-sized pieces so we can understand just a little bit the priority of living a godly life. We've seen the influence of apostasy, how it was influencing and breaking up a church at Ephesus. Timothy was given the instructions to confront and expose all the false teachings that were in their leadership positions. But it was a massive task. Now he's going to give Timothy positive encouragement. And he does so with the first idea, the pursuit of godliness is encouraged. This is what he is doing. To counter the culture of apostasy that was making so much of an inroad into the church, Paul confronts it with the concept of pursuing godliness and he says, this is what we should make as our priority in life. Now, I want us to understand something very important here. We cannot manufacture godliness. We just can't. It's not something, humanly speaking, that you and I can manufacture. Godliness refers to what's on the inside that comes out. It has to make its way on the outside. And so how then do we define it or put it into some definition that we can understand? How would you tell someone what godliness is? Well, that's helpful. But as we look at it, godliness is simply the desire to be like God. Now, don't misunderstand me. It's not saying that we become God, but we become like God. In other words, we show the same attributes that he has because we now belong to him. Now, what do I mean by that? In the scriptures, he tells us, he is holy, you be holy. We are to show his love the way that he loves us. And so you get the idea, it goes on and on. As we live our, live our lives, we do it to please God. And as we live to please God and serve God, then this godliness that's within us, this transformation that is now taking place shows itself in our words and our actions and our attitudes in everyday life. What it reveals to us or reveals to the world is we now belong to Jesus Christ and they can see his likeness and his image as he's transforming us. And so the more we study the word, and that's the key to it, studying the word, the more the word transforms us and we become more Christ-like in our lives. It means that people will see less of us and they will see more of him. And that's the focus that Paul has on Timothy, on his character, on the things he is to watch out for, as Paul says, as a good servant of Jesus Christ. This is something that applies to every Christian, not just to Timothy, but to all of us. So it's a lesson for all of us how to make godliness something that's a priority in our life. We tend to get caught up in the things of the world. He says, you forget about worldliness and you live a godly life. Well, as we break it up, the principle in that first part is by pointing out such things to the brothers and sisters you'll be a good servant of Jesus Christ 
So the first is the principle. And the principle Paul is, says to Timothy is this. It's not complicated. It's not rocket science. He's saying that I want you to contrast the beliefs of those who are false teachers with your beliefs. I want you to compare it. When you look at the false teachers, they're teaching errors. And it shows in the inconsistent way that they live out their lives. They live lives that say, do this, but they don't live it themselves. They do the opposite. And Timothy, Paul says, listen to what I'm about to tell you. That is not the way that you are. You are to be different because you are different. You are to live a godly, Christ-like life that encourages this in others who follow Jesus Christ. In other words, you're to be the good example for them to follow. You are to be a good servant of Jesus Christ. In your role as a teacher of the word of God, Paul says to Timothy, you're a guardian of its truth. And as a guardian of its truth, you're to expose error where you find it without fear or favor. You're to bring people's attention to the word of God and what it has to say. And when you do this, it points out everything that he's been dealing with in the previous chapters 1, 2, and 3, where there would be a falling away from the faith, where people would be paying more attention to false teachings and doctrines of demons, where there would be an exposure to liars who promote the forbidding of marriage and abstaining certain foods to become spiritual instead of enjoying them as gifts from God. All of these are errors. All of these things, Paul says, Timothy, you expose them. You deal with their errors. Now, even though this advice is given to Timothy, it applies to every Christian today because you and I are called to be servants of God. Each one of us is to please God in the things we say and do. Paul's main concern is to contradict the teachings of error that were being promoted in the church. And when we look through history, if you like history, some people find it boring, I'll find it fascinating from time to time because we always seem to repeat the same mistakes again and again in different generations. But at any given time, we can see how this religious error expresses itself in one of two ways. It's done, first of all, with liberty or with license. This is where the errors creep in. It has the idea that I'm free to do whatever I want because of a license to do it. This is license or, or the liberty or license. It's the freedom. I can do whatever I want because I'm free. And by thinking this way is to misunderstand what the grace of God is all about. Because yes, we're free in Christ, but that's not liberty to do whatever we want. There's a responsibility and people don't like that idea. It doesn't mean that I can do whatever I want. Once saved, always saved. It's the attitude that says no one should ever tell me that I need to discipline myself, discipline myself to do all these things because that's legalism and I'm not bound to keep the law. That's license. And that's what a lot of people take for granted today. I'm free from the law. I can do whatever I want. God loves me. My sins are forgiven. Hallelujah. Let's get on with it. Then we have the other error, legalism. Legalism is where everyone is regulated by rules and restrictions placed upon their freedoms. Now, we know what that's a bit like. In Australia, we're seeing a lot more of that happening in different ways. But legalism says you need to do this if you want to be accepted. You're not allowed to question. You must do it because you've been told to do it if you want to be considered a good and moral person. In other words, the philosophy is don't rock the boat, just go with the flow and you'll be okay. Do the external things and everything will be okay. Is there any, which one would you choose? License or legalism? or none of them? No. What would you do instead? 
Would you live somewhere in between? You see, both liberty and both legalism are wrong approaches because it's more than just doing what everybody else is doing. Paul's instruction is to point these things out to the brethren, to the people of God. Make sure the church understands these errors and attitudes being promoted amongst them. In other words, these external things do not promote a godly life and the church needs to know it. It's not how much you put in the plate. It's not how many good deeds you've done. That doesn't make a godly life. That's a religious life, but it's not a godly life. Now, the interesting thing as we travel the Christian life and journey together is that many times we'll pull up route and we'll go somewhere else. Now, I left my home in a little place called Blacktown. Well, it's a big place now, but it was a little place. And I pulled up stakes and I end up here in Darwin. You pulled up stakes probably from Sydney, Melbourne, uh, all over. And basically uh, what you've had to do is um, move to a different place. And being a Christian that has the responsibility that you want a fellowship or find a church where you can set up a home church and a roots. And so you've got to find out a church. How do you go about finding a church that you want to set up as your home church? What are you looking for? Replacement Not replacement theology. Okay. And? The Bible being preached? And? fellowship you see there are things all good legitimate questions but sadly many Christians today have become consumers they're shopping around the churches to see what church will give them the best deal and provide them with everything they feel will meet their family needs now I've met such Christians and they've said to me pastor if we come here what can you give us what benefits are there for us to stay here that will keep us here? What do you think my answer is and has been? Well, that might be the human part of me that says, well, don't let the door hit you on the way out. But I can't provide you with any of those things. Any of the things they're looking for. But you know what gets me excited as a pastor? is when a family comes to me and says, we're new in the area, we love the Lord, we want to serve him in this community, how can you use us? How and what can we do to enrich the church fellowship that is here? That excites me. Not someone says, well, if I stay here, what, what can you give me? What benefit is there for my family? I would rather someone say to me, look, we want to serve the Lord here and we can do this and this. Can you use us? Because that shows a heart for the Lord. You see, there there's, is a difference. It's not about what I can get from a church. It's what I can give. That makes a difference. Now, I want to know what the church believes. Make no mistake. I want to know that it is Bible-based I want to know whether it has a biblical foundation in preaching and teaching. I want to know that the church promotes a balanced and healthy local church life. All these things matter. I want to know that the Bible is the sole authority in matters of faith and testimony. I want to know that the pastor is faithful in proclaiming all the Bible, not just bits and pieces, but presents its truth consistently week after week and is not afraid to say what the Bible says or what it's against because that's the message I need to hear in an ever-changing world. I want to know that the message of the gospel never changes. It's consistent. And I want to know that the preaching and teaching of the word of God will not change. 
will be the same message preached without fear or favour. It will confront error where it finds it. That's what I want to know. That's a good church. It's a balanced church that is alive. It enables me then and encourages me to use the gifts, not only to enrich my own life, but the life of that church together. So the principle is there, Timothy says, and being told, if you want to live a godly life, then start showing it. Then he says, there's the protection. Having nourished yourself on the words of the faith, of the good teaching that you have followed. It's an awesome responsibility for Timothy. He's a guardian of the word of God and the doctrine of truth. And it means that as a guardian, he needs to protect the very thing that teaches us how to live our lives for God. So Paul is saying to Timothy, a good servant of Jesus Christ will spend his whole life mastering and getting a handle on one book. Just one book. One book that God has inspired and placed all his truth in. This is expressed in our text as someone who is constantly nourished on the words of faith and of the sound doctrine. To nourish comes from the Greek word, and I don't know that I can do it justice, entrophomenos. And it has the idea how the word of God is to be used to build the person up in their faith. A better translation is someone who's being trained in the words of faith. It's in the present tense and means that this is something that's continually happening. It's not just a once-off occasion. It's something that's happening all the time. It comes through a daily practice of disciplining ourselves in the word which provides us with the nourishment to our souls. Our text says logois, meaning the words of faith. These are the things that will build up our faith. That's how important the word of God is because the word of God transforms, it changes. It, in other words, a person's life is changed by what they read. It's a precision instrument this is speaking of the word of God, used by the power of the Holy Spirit to reach us where we are and change us. How many times have you been in a situation where you don't know what to do, you've opened the word of God, you've asked for his help, and the passage seems to speak right out to you. It seems to be speaking to where you are at that present moment. Hebrews 4, 12 through 13 says, God's word is alive and working, is sharper than double-edged sword. It cuts all the way into us where the soul and the spirit are joined to the center of our joints and bones. It judges the thoughts and feelings in our hearts. Nothing in all the world can be hidden from God. Everything is clear, lies open before him, and to him we must explain the way we have lived. It makes it very plain. Our text mentions sound doctrine or good teaching to equip us to live a life of godliness. And what Paul is exhorting Timothy to do, he's saying, you're very capable in the faith. You be nourished. You be trained up in the word of God as it relates to things that are both practical and theological. In other words, there's theory and practical. You put, put them both together. You just don't use the theory and don't put the practical into um, practice. You see... Do I look at the word of God as just a bunch of words? Is it just a bunch of words? Because if it is, I'm going to miss out. Because the word of God is practical. It does something and we ought to see that it stimulates us. It makes us think. It makes us examine. It makes us better after reading it to do something. The only way that a Christian will ever grow and develop their faith is by being nourished by the word of God and doing what it says. Our minds will be renewed. They'll be transformed by the word of God as the Holy Spirit takes it and applies its truth to our lives, enabling us to overcome the challenge of being conformed to this world and its thinking. That's the only thing that will transform us. 
the Bible will become the sole focus for a faithful minister's preaching and teaching. He will allow it to saturate his mind and all his thinking. He will make a commitment to study it. He will give the proper exegesis. It's all he can do. He knows nothing else in his life, and this encompasses all his training. The faithful minister will be the one that points out these things so that we can prioritize our lives and how to live them in a godly way. He then moves on to the prevention. Now, I wonder if you can guess what that is from this picture. It says, but reject those myths fit only for the godless and gullible. Let me explain it because the Greek brings it out much better than the English here. Paul's instruction couldn't be clearer. Reject worldly fables and, fables and silly myths. Have nothing to do with them. Why? Because they're fit only for old women. Ouch. To be more precise from the original language, it says, have nothing to do with old wives' tales. Now, is Paul being discriminatory here? Think about it for a moment. Because the Greek word, graiodis, old wives' tables, or uh, old wives' tales, or urban legends. In other words, things that are said or made up that simply are not true, but over time have grown and developed into something that they were never intended to be. We all know about the fisherman's tale, the one that got away. You know, it was this big and it got this big, and every time it's told, it seems to get bigger by whoever was telling it. Now, some people say they object to Paul. He's saying, look, Paul is putting down all the women when he refers to them as old wives' tales. But when you look at it, that's not the case. This was meant to be a form of sarcasm to indicate that what was said lacks any credibility to be believed as if it was true. The reasoning behind this is that the old women were used because they tended to live longer than the old men who were dead. As the women, old women get older, they lose their ability to process information. And Paul is simply saying, why would you listen or pay attention to someone who makes up stories? That's what Paul is bringing behind it. And he says, Timothy, have nothing to do with it. Paratomeo, he says, reject them, avoid them, shun them, don't play with them, don't entertain them in any way, shape or form, do not take them lightly, reject them for what they are, worldly fables, fables. that's all they are, they're of no value or use to you. He uses the word bel belos, and used for, it's a word used for worldly, which means profane when you say useless and meaningless things to profane something means to take something which is holy something that is sacred and make it common and of no value that's the opposite of living a godly life reject these muthos or myths or fables they're just vain imaginations nothing more than falsehoods that have been made up separate yourselves from them there was and still is a danger for young men who start out in the ministry who have sat under or have been taught error by someone who believed that what they were teaching being errors was true in the first place and the sad thing is it's happening more and more in our religious seminaries that are training men for the ministry and the mission field. There are professors who deny the cardinal truths of the Bible, that Jesus isn't God, that he was just a man. They deny the atonement. And so when you've got young men being taught by these academic preachers, these young men take that error 
into the churches with them and promote it among uh, the congregations. So what Paul was saying is, don't believe these fables. These men who say they have a profound message, a better message for you than the one I gave you, one that is better than the one given by the apostles, what they're teaching you simply is this, Timothy, it's just old wives' tales. It's empty. It's unprofitable. Because it's empty and unprofitable, it's harmful. It hurts people. Why? Because it doesn't build people up. It can't do anything to help them. If truth is for life, if God's truth is for the living of the Christian life, if God's truth is to make us more like him, more loving, more faithful, more obedient, then the false teaching cannot produce anything like this. So in other words, prevent yourself by embracing false fables and old wives' tales. He then says, preparation, you've got a bloke there in the gym. I wouldn't be able to do that. Got no interest to do that. But it says, train yourself for godliness. This second command from Paul is to discipline yourself, get yourself ready, train yourself to be godly. You reject the myths, the old wives' tales, discipline yourself, follow the one that is more beneficial for you. Is it possible for a person to live a godly life without truth? Can they become more Christ-like without the truth of the Word of God? And of course the answer is no. But we need to understand that there are many people who are religious, but they don't know the truth. They are certainly not godly in the way that they live their lives. They can be very disciplined people, but they do not meet the requirements of living a godly life. Paul says, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. That means rejecting and resisting what is false. Paul said there are a number of false teachers in Ephesus who were promoting an external and disciplined approach to godliness. And they were insisting you don't get married. You stopped eating certain kinds of food. We would classify them as legalists. And they were disciplined. If you do these things, you'll be more godly. You'll be more spiritual. Paul's response was one of not throwing out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. He wasn't promoting a free license under grace to go and do whatever you wanted, like enjoy yourself because you're not under the law but under grace. Paul rejected their teachings, their myths. He says, you pursue godliness through disciplining yourself in the word of truth. But you may ask, isn't that still promoting a form of legalism? And this is where we possibly got a hard time getting our heads around the concept of God's grace. Many people think it's a license to do whatever we want. We are free from restrictions and limitations, but that's not true. We are to live lives that honour the Lord Jesus Christ. That means we're going to learn to bring our minds, our bodies, our actions, our attitudes under subjection to do this. In other words, we need to train or discipline ourselves to accomplish this. And it's interesting. I keep on saying the original. The Greek is very interesting in so much as that it brings out a lot more than the English. The Greek word for discipline is gymnasia. And it's the word where we get our modern word, gymnasium. But the root word for gymnasium comes from the word naked because the, in the Greek games, that's how they competed. They did, not, they did that because in their minds, they wanted to be unhindered. If they were going to run, they didn't want anything to hold them back. They used to run. They used to compete. They were used to doing things naked. So this athletic metaphor was that of training for the games. And Paul is saying that we ought to discipline ourselves, we ought to train ourselves for the purpose of godliness. We ought to fight, we ought to work hard. And godliness is not something that just happens. It comes through training and discipline to make sense because we want to become more like Jesus Christ and display that 
in everything we do in life. As Philippians 2, 12, 13 says, My dear friends, you've always obeyed God when I was with you. It is even more important that you obey now while I'm away from you. Keep on working to complete your salvation with fear and trembling because God is working in you to help you want to do and be able to do what pleases you. So our text is telling me that God is working in me to do what? What's God working in your life and my life to do? Well, be more like Jesus, but what he's telling me in the text is to will and do his good pleasure. That's what God is working out in my life. And what it's telling me, God is involved in the whole process. He's working it out in our lives to enable us to live it out in such a way it brings honour and glory to him. But God's at work all the time. We received his gift of salvation by faith, but that's not the end of it. We don't sit back and just let God do whatever he wants while we sit back and enjoy the ride. No, you and I are to cooperate and show our love and thanks to him by living a life that has been transformed by him. That means we are to understand what he's done. Then we discipline our lives, bring them under subjection to do what is good and right and worthy. That's what we do. Now, then there's the profession. For physical exercise is some value, but godliness is valuable in every way. Why do we discipline ourselves? What benefits are they doing? Now, if I was to say, is there any great benefit in physical exercise? What would you tell me? No. There is, isn't there? There is great benefit. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense to do it. So there is great benefit in exercising in physical sense. But if the physical exercise is more important than spiritual exercise... And discipline is much more beneficial to anyone engaged in it. Discipline doesn't make the Christian life easy. It makes it easy to do. Now, how does that work out in a practical way? Let me give you some examples. The Christian woman who finds herself struggling with a husband who is mean and nasty and takes every opportunity to put her down, how does and how can she exercise godliness in such a difficult situation? And this is repeated many times around the world. How does she do it? What is she to do? Husband mean and nasty and putting her down at every opportunity. What's she supposed to do? If you're in that situation, what would you do? The godly woman, she is to be determined that she will not respond in kind. She will not lower herself to her husband's standards. She takes it to the Lord in prayer. She reads the word. She applies it. And as a result, it enables her to have the power and strength to rise above her circumstances and respond to the wrongs being done in her life with grace and love. Why? How can that happen? Because it's God at work. She's honoring God in what she does. She's living a godly life. She doesn't have to respond in kind to the way and the methodology of a husband. Now that doesn't mean the husband will change because only God can do that. But she herself is changed. Her attitude is that she's doing this as if she would do it for the Lord. In other words, she does it through disciplining her life to live a godly life. That takes effort. It takes a lot of hard work. Take, for instance, a Christian man who's wrestling with pornography and lust and is trying to guard what he looks at and what he reads, who he associates with, and is trying to take the appropriate steps for an escape plan when he's tempted to give in to any temptation that he may encounter. That's becoming more and more a uh, relative uh, situation to most Christian men today. How can a Christian man live a godly life when he's surrounded by all these things? 
And it's not an easy situation for this man to walk away from temptation. But it becomes easier for him if he is praying, if he's holding himself accountable. He has been reading his Bible. He's been asking for strength. He's disciplining his mind and body to remain godly when he encounters the challenges of temptation that challenge him to do the wrong thing. So the purpose of discipline is to prepare us when we encounter life's difficulties. They enable us to live out the Christian life. Now, if you ask a person preparing for the Olympics to run the 100-meter dash, you ask them, is it worth it? What do you think they would say? They would look you in the eye and say, yes, it is. And you think, they work for four years training their body to run under 10 seconds. What a waste. 10 seconds, it's all over. And you spend all that time preparing to run just a 10 second race or under 10 seconds. To us, it seems ridiculous to put so much effort, so much time, so much discipline just to run this way. Yet, those athletes think nothing of it. They'll do it again and again and again. Paul says where to pursue and cultivate godliness, it isn't easy, but living the Christian life isn't meant to be easy either. It's being prepared for a life that isn't easy, but it becomes less difficult if we discipline and train ourselves to live this life. And as we finish, the proof. It holds promise for the present life and the life to come. Paul stresses the fact that not only does your spiritual exercise and your spiritual workout make a difference in this present life, but also the one to come. We're preparing for the life to come. We're disciplining ourselves here and now. To live the godly life is something in which we're dependent on God to produce in us. It's something that we are to dedicate ourselves to do. That means we're to get on the same page as God, understanding what he does and what we are required to do in order to achieve the same purposes and goals. To accomplish this requires strenuous training, the denial of self and what it wants if we're to live a consistent godly life. And that means, as this little thing says, if any man be in Christ, all things are passed away, all things are become new. To disciple ourselves or discipline ourselves to be godly means dealing with the loose ends that will hinder or trip us up. It means protecting our minds against falsehood. It means putting our bodies into submission. It means having and maintaining a pure conscience. It means that you cannot be branded a hypocrite for saying one thing while doing the opposite. The proof is when we discipline ourselves in prayer, through reading the word, meditating upon what it has to say, and then doing it. We experience the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. He enables us to live that truth out before a watching world. This is the first step. Make godliness a priority in your life. That's a challenge, and we've only just scratched the surface of this particular subject. There's more to come. As we close, we're going to...